Libya has an important geopolitical position. It's in the middle of North Africa's Mediterranean coast. Uh, it's bordered by Tunisia and Algeria to the west and Egypt to the east. And this is very important, as you will see in a second. But it, more importantly, it also, uh, it's southern, uh, um, you know, the, it, it, uh, the southern edges border Niger, Chad, and Sudan. I'm mentioning this because uh, the Sahel is very important. And when we go back to the, uh, the beginning of this, uh, the, the turmoil uh, in Libya, which goes back to 2011 with the, the Arab uh, uprising, uh, you know, it had a fallout. Of course, in the Q&A, those who are interested in the fallout in the Sahel, more specifically in terms of what happened in Mali, uh, and to a lesser uh, extent in, in Niger, it's all there. And now you see also, uh, you know, troops uh, being recruited in Sudan and so on and so forth. So it's very complicated. Another part is that it is the fourth uh, largest country in Africa by land mass. It ranks 36 by population. In, in this respect, it looks uh, uh, similar uh, to the Gulf states, in other words, small, small population and extremely rich. It's a very rich country, uh, a huge country, uh, has a merely 6.2 million, but with the people who have left, uh, it's probably less uh, today because many people uh, have fled to Tunisia, Malta, and, and some other places. And Libya uh, is uh, has the ninth largest proven uh, oil uh, reserves uh, in uh, in the world and in Africa as well. So, so I start with uh, talking about a failed uh, revolution. You know that um, from 1969 to 2011, um, Libya was ruled by uh, an autocrat, dictator, uh, name him, and something important to mention, he did not build a state uh, uh, to speak of, um, you know, it was a totally different conception uh, of the state from what uh, we understand. The, the uprising started uh, in Tunisia, of course. Tunisia was the, the first to have uh, experienced an uprising, a protest movement against yet another dictator in the region, which was uh, Zinedine Ben Ali. Uh, and that spilled over, had a, um, a spillover effect on Libya when it started. Um, to make a story short, then there was the NATO um, intervention. And I'd like to emphasize here that the interests, in other words, the reasons that pushed this intervention was not, uh, were not uh, innocent. There were already interests uh, involved in that. And when I, when I cover the various uh, players, you will see why uh, they, they intervened. Uh, uh, and why the U.S. up to today is reluctant uh, to continue or to be uh, present or to get fully involved uh, in Libya. So one of the important points I'd like to make is that uh, the, the overthrow of Gaddafi had nothing to do with the human rights or the right to, to protect, but the, from the onset, the objective, at least for some of the uh, those who intervened, was, uh, and uh, particularly France uh, and the UK, uh, to overthrow, to have a, a regime change in uh, Libya. That's one. Uh, because if you analyze that period, you will see that there was resistance to a political solution, uh, mainly from the African Union, uh, which tried to broker some sort of exit uh, for Gaddafi. I interviewed the then head uh, of the African Union, uh, Jean Ping, uh, and uh, he had all the evidence that they would not allow the African Union uh, to uh, try to uh, bring about a peaceful resolution to the conflict. The consequences that, again, we can talk in the Q&A were the destabilization of the, uh, the Sahel, the emergence of new uh, terrorist groups, and then eventually the implantation of terrorist groups uh, within Libya itself and in the Sahel. And they're both, uh, it's still ongoing nine years after what had happened. 
the other uh, uh, word, I mean, the other point that I'd like to make before I go into the outside players is the different parties in Libya. They fail to come uh, to to find uh, common grounds for the reconstruction of Libya. The country finds itself with two governments. I'm sorry, I cannot uh, delve into the uh, the domestic uh, aspects. It's too long, uh, but you have two. Basically, you have two governments right now, one in the western part of the country in Tripoli and the other one in Tobruk in Cyrenaica in the east. And to make matters worse, as of uh, 2014, a rogue, uh, uh, you know, uh, marshal, self-proclaimed marshal, uh, who had returned from the United States where he had been living uh, after he, uh, self-imposed exile, he was a, a part of the uh, uh, government of uh, uh, of Gaddafi, uh, and he had fought in in Chad. Was humiliated in Chad. In fact, lost the war like he just did uh, recently. But uh, he uh, launched what he called the Operation Libya Dignity, claiming to be fighting terrorism. That's that's the claim. You're going to see that all the players in the, the Libyan crisis, they would say one thing and be doing something else. The, the other reasons would be that. That's the job of, uh, you know, a, a researcher is to go beyond, you know, the discourse and to look at what the real interests are. Um, and of course, uh, you know, the, there was another one, uh, uh, you know, a, a, an Operation Libya Dawn, which was a coalition of militia from uh, from Eastern and uh, Central Libya, from Tripolitana, uh, spearheaded by forces from Misrata. So this is uh, just to complicate uh, the situation for 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 the audience. Uh, very complicated. Basically, if you look at the domestic situation today in Libya. The best way to describe it, I think, um, in my view, would be to use the concept of collapsed state. Uh, although, as I said, uh, one might argue that uh, Gaddafi never built uh, a state in the modern sense of the term. He had his own idiosyncratic conception of the state, uh, of which you know he was uh, the big master, basically. Um, so we have today two forces, really, uh, that are uh, in opposition, which is the uh, Libyan uh, National Army, uh, led by Marshal uh, Khalifa Haftar, um, which has been targeting uh, the GNA. Uh, so please remember GNA, which is the government of national accord. This is the government that is recognized by the international community. It's recognized by uh, the UN. But what is happening on the ground abuse of human rights, uh, which is common, terrorism, hundreds of thousands of Libyans internally displaced due to the ongoing, you know, military conflict, tens of thousands of refugees, you know, from Africa and so on, so from sub-Saharan Africa, and of course, uh, asylum seekers. Uh, since the war, uh, as I said, most parties speak about a political solution. Uh, everyone is in agreement that there would be no uh, military solution to the conflict, but each time one of the parties uh, is uh, has the upper hand, you know, it's of course does not want to negotiate and the other party would like to negotiate and I'll try to explain this in a second. However, the reality on the ground, as I said, is totally different. The UN has been involved. There's a huge, you know, um, uh, lots of, uh, uh, you know, initiatives and so on, they all failed. Uh, and there were some other initiatives launched by either Russia or by Germany, by Merkel, you know, the last happened in, uh, in January of this year, the Berlin Conference, it's also uh, ended in, in failure. Even to bring a, a ceasefire has been, uh, you know, very difficult and also resulted uh, in failure. My argument before I move on to the uh, outside powers is that because of the varied interests, this is my really my position, uh, which you know you have various powers which would uh, uh, back one or the other side in the conflict, and that has continued. And I will give you which side is with 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 who and so on. And so, uh, what I will discuss now is the uh, the foreign parties' interests. And this will reveal 
basically this contradiction, this discrepancy uh, between the discourse and uh, reality. Uh, and so, so you have two governments, uh, one in the East, one in the West, and so they get military support and other support uh, from uh, the, the players I would be talking about. But of course, the complication in Libya is not simply that there are these two governments, but they are somewhat what we call a sub-states uh, that are controlled by either or, 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 or um, uh, by loosely aligned tribal militia and jihadist groups. So the alliances are made and, and undone, you know, done, undone, uh, you know, at will. So uh, your ally of today will be your enemy of tomorrow, and so on and so forth. Internally really the struggle, what is happening also, is essentially a struggle for power and resources between locally armed factions. Because when Gaddafi collapsed, when the regime collapsed, many people had access to uh, uh, weaponry, and some of which very modern weaponry, and some of it went to the Sahel region, and some of, of it fell into the hands of militias and other uh, such groups, including, uh, you know, uh, terrorist groups. So what will be evident uh, in what I will be discussing is virtually none of the outside forces has any genuine interest in the Libyan people. That I, uh, I will emphasize. The Libyan political elites have also failed to reach consensus, which would have allowed either a ceasefire or reconstruction of the country, you know, post-conflict uh, reconstruction. In this sense, I would say that the local elites uh, are as guilty as the foreign powers in prolonging the civil war. And lastly, the continued civil war will exacerbate instability in North Africa and the Sahel. And I should add a last one, uh, one of these points. This, if it continues for too long, may result in the uh, fragmentation of Libya into at least two states. Uh, that is the Eastern and the, the Western uh, state. So um, this interference, to just to make it simple for my audience here, is that there are four powers that are supporting Haftar. Khalifa Haftar, the head of the uh, Libyan National Army, supported by the House of Representatives. Um, you know, that's, that's the sort of parliament, the government in, in, in the East. Um, and uh, right now he's currently in Egypt. My understanding is that he's in sort of exile in Egypt after the defeat, the recent defeat uh, this year when he tried to take over Tripoli. So, um, so you have Egypt that supports Haftar, the United Arab Emirates with um, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia financing and, you know, and supporting uh, the UAE, the United Arab Emirates, Russia and France. These are the players that support uh, Khalifa Haftar. Turkey, Qatar, Italy support the government of national, unit, uh, of national accord, which is the GNA based in Tripoli. So, I will go over now the uh, the various countries and what their interests are. Uh, and please, Karima, I have a tendency of being carried away <laughs> talking too much. Uh, please give me about 10 minutes before my time is up, you should tell me, so that I can jump into some other topics that I would like to share with, uh, with your participants. So Egypt has a... Uh, some strategic reasons to be involved in Libya. First, it, it shares 700 miles, uh, a border of 700 miles uh, with Libya. It, in many ways, Libya has always been linked to, uh, to, to, to Egypt. Uh, I just mentioned that Gaddafi was very, um, wanted to be the second image uh, of uh, Nasser, who had ruled Egypt until his death in 71, uh, you know, and after the passing of uh, Nasser, there were tensions uh, with the new regime in, in Egypt and so on and so forth. And so for Egypt, since the fall of Gaddafi and the experience with the Muslim Brotherhood, please do remember this Muslim Brotherhood because it's part of this whole, uh, it's, it's sort of the ideological 
uh, tip of, of, of the iceberg, but it's not really uh, the main reason. Uh, as I, I would try to show, the other reasons are economic, military, strategic, and so on and so forth. So, so the Muslim Brotherhood was accused of being uh, a terrorist uh, movement uh, in 2013, and so there was a, a, a coup basically against the um, uh, legitimately democratically elected uh, Morsi. Um, and so, so for Egypt to see uh, this Muslim Brotherhood uh, expanding uh, in Libya uh, is used as an argument uh, to support uh, Haftar. Haftar claims to be, you know, fighting terrorism. And of course, this appealed uh, to the Egyptians. And so the Egyptians, of course, Egypt is ruled by a dictator, by um, Abdel Fattah Hassisi, and they see Haftar as a strong man uh, capable uh, of controlling Cyrenaica, where most of the oil is located. Uh, so, and in, in for the Egyptians, the controlled Cyrenaica can serve as a buffer zone against, allegedly, jihadist groups that could destabilize uh, Egypt. So the, 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 what also uh, worries uh, the Egyptians is this close, uh, the close bonds uh, between the Libyan branch of the Muslim Brotherhood with the GNA. That is a major impetus for uh, Egypt's uh, support to Haftar and his uh, uh, LNA. Um, so if you look at Egypt, I mean, I can say a lot about uh, Egypt. It has some legitimate uh, concerns and others that are not so legitimate. And so Egypt has security and economic uh, concerns in Libya, as I mentioned already, the Muslim Brotherhood. Um, so, but they are afraid that some members of the Brotherhood or radicalized could exploit the proximity uh, with Egypt, because many of them are present in Libya, that they would somehow organize attacks against uh, Egypt. The economic reasons are, more, uh, are quite interesting because Egypt needs oil. It's not an oil producing country. Uh, it produces a little bit, uh, but uh, they, they have benefited from cheap oil uh, since the uh, Libyan National Army uh, controls the eastern part where the oil is. So, so in exchange for the support that it provides the NLA, Egypt receives oil at a discounted rate. That's what it is. And so, so there is this uh, uh, the fear that if the LNA loses the civil war, the oil supplies to Egypt would unavoidably be interrupted, and it would result in steep rises of prices. In, Egyptian, in the Egyptian market. Remember, the, Egypt, the Egyptian economy is very dependent on the Gulf, on, on, on cheap oil. I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a real mess. So, and before the, even before the revolution, there were two million Egyptian workers in Libya. Uh, and they were sent back. Uh, I mean, they used to send, by the way, uh, remittances uh, to Egypt and that helped the Egyptian economy, uh, and so on and so forth. So Egypt has developed a sort of dependency on subsidized Libyan oil. This needs to be, uh, uh, you know, to, to show you the import, the economic importance uh, of Libya to Egypt because Egypt has an ailing uh, economy and so a stable Libya uh, pro providing uh, cheap oil and so on, and maybe getting some workers, you know, as an outlet for uh, the huge manpower. Egypt has about 100 million people compared to Libya, which has uh, 6.2 million. You know, you can see uh, where, uh, what that means. So, um, and again, i just say briefly about the uh, presence of Turkey recently, and that has a really created a, a serious headache, uh, as we will see, not only for Egypt, but also for France. Uh, that, that is a, a big issue, uh, this um, presence of Turkey, and I will explain why Turkey is there. Um, so, uh, so we are, again, in what we call a proxy war, uh, Egypt, you know, supports the LNA, and then uh, the LNA had uh, some, um, uh, you know, uh, at least Haftar uh, thought that he 
would be able to take all over Libya, be the strong man, you know, a new dictator, if you wish, and so on, um, supported by the UAE and Egypt. But then, you know, the GNA called on, the, on Turkey, which intervened and not only stopped uh, the advance uh, of uh, Haftar, but it also pushed back, uh, defeated in the, in the process, the, the group that's uh, the, uh, another backer, uh, of the LNA, which is uh, Russia, pushed it back, and, uh, and now uh, there is a sort of stalemate, and that is uh, uh, another issue. So, so you have again uh, now tensions between Turkey and, and Egypt, plus um, you know uh, the, uh, the Turkey is also ruled by uh, a Muslim Brotherhood, uh, by the Muslim, I mean, a party. Uh, which is uh, based on uh, Muslim Brotherhood ideology and so on and so forth. So, so Egypt, again, has continued to support this LNA, you know, uh, providing, uh, training its forces in Western Egypt, launching, launching operations from there and so on and so forth. So, and, and all the equipment and, and what have you. So, so this move by Turkey uh, has uh, led Egypt to consider uh, intervening uh, in, in Libya, uh, in Eastern Libya. Uh, I don't believe that they would, but it's uh, at least uh, it shows how worried uh, Egypt is about that uh, presence. Um, so uh, uh, I'm afraid I, I will have, a, I may have to skip to, because I have too much on, uh, on Egypt, I will skip it a little bit and take you straight to Turkey. Turkey, uh, of course, you know, there is the history. Today, the Arabs are very worried. Turkey, the former Ottoman Empire, and so on and so forth. And uh, uh, Erdogan is the new sultan who wants to uh, revive this old uh, domination over North Africa, like he did under Ottoman rule, that is, uh, you know, uh, Libya, uh, Algeria, and Tunisia, which were under uh, Ottoman rule. Uh, so, so, um, Basically, when, when Haftar uh, failed, or at least when Asaraj, you know, the leader of the GNA, called on Turkey to help, and Turkey came to the rescue, uh, this again uh, created some problems. But before it happened, uh, and here you will see the interest, how uh, th there was a, a, the signing of a memorandum of understanding between the GNA, and uh, uh, and Turkey on um, uh, on demarcating the new maritime jurisdiction between them, and that basically the consequence of that had gone uh, uh, all the way to um, Cyprus, uh, Greece, created tensions between, and there are currently, as we speak right now, there are real tensions between Greece. Uh, and, and Turkey over the issue, and the Greeks would like, you know, the European Union to, to intervene and so on and so forth. So, because this deal may divide uh, the, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the Eastern and the Western uh, Mediterranean. Uh, so, basically, Turkey has started already uh, um, exploiting, exploring oil in the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, and apparently there are the, the U.S. government, a geological survey in the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, you know, re mentioned that there would be about $700 billion worth uh, of, uh, of natural gas uh, in the part that uh, Turkey now will start uh, exploring or has already started exploring. So it's a huge uh, reserve, um, you know. Uh, so. Europe uh, protested, but that has not changed um, the objective uh, of the uh, of the Turks. So, uh, and of course, what happened in Libya, uh, this deal uh, was, you know, to lead Greece, Cyprus, and Israel and Egypt, uh, you know, to start working on their own. Uh, pipeline, which will cost seven to nine billion, but of course the problem is that the deal with uh, between Turkey and Tripoli uh, would obstruct the plan, since the pipeline would have to cross the 
Turkey Libya uh, jurisdiction. So we will have uh, some uh, very uh, considerable uh, problems uh, in the near future, not in the long term, but near future. Uh, so what else uh, is there for, for Turkey? Turkey has very important economic interests in addition to the oil, the gas, the Mediterranean and so on, but the Libyan market um, uh, in, in Libya. They, for, for decades, uh, Turkish businesses uh, had been involved in Libya, especially in the construction sector. Uh, before uh, Gaddafi was overthrown, there were about 100 uh, Turkish uh, construction companies uh, had signed contracts uh, with the uh, uh, Libyan government. Um, but because of the Arab Spring, um, Turkey lost about $19 billion. Of course, Turkey was not the only one that lost. China had also lost and Russia, uh, which had invested uh, heavily. We'll come to that later. Um, so yeah, my I'm prognosis sorry, you is have that... 10 minutes now. I'm okay, giving great. you the warning. Thanks, yeah. All right, thank you. So, um, so I will uh, skip uh, more on Turkey. I will take you to France. Um, France uh, recently, if you if you follow, France has had a uh, a very uh, interesting uh, position. That is, um, it it says one thing and it does something completely different. And we have discovered that mostly in 2016 when uh, some troops were killed in Libya and a military helicopter uh, had crashed uh, in Libya. But now you, what you will hear is how uh, unnerved France is about uh, uh, Turkey's, Turkey's presence uh, in the territory. So, you know, some Libyans tend to remind us, and correctly so, that French interventionism in, in Libyan affairs dates to the 1940s, when France tried to occupy and keep control of the southern uh, Libyan province of Fezzan. You know, Libya is divided into three provinces, Tripolitana, Cyrenaica, and the Fezzan, and France were, was wanted to occupy that part uh, for its economic and mili military interests. So, so basically, France was uh, one of the leading forces against the Gaddafi regime for the regime change. And um, Sarkozy, that former president who, who was behind that, you know, supported the revolution against Gaddafi to restore basically France's domination, you know, as a or you know dominant role as a European military power. Uh, in 2014, France allied with the United Arab Emirates and supported the Egyptian and UAE-sponsored uh, Haftar. That's, you know, it, it supports Haftar, although in rhetoric it is, uh, you know, uh, for, uh, uh, you know, a negotiated uh, solution, etc., cetera, et cetera. Uh, France is very interesting because, um, you know, it does exactly the same thing as Turkey has done, but then it criticizes Turkey, insults Turkey, gets in trouble with Turkey, uh, which is a fellow member uh, of NATO, but, uh, you know, uh, it, it's just the, the, the game that, uh, that nations uh, play. But uh, for most uh, analysts, without Turkish intervention, the Russian and Sudanese mercenaries, uh, which are part of the LNA, you know, would have overwhelmed uh, Tripoli and so on. So, so basically what France is doing in, in Libya is also pursuing its economic and security, what it perceives as its security uh, interest. So, um, you know, the alignment with, with now it's uh, undisputable, the alignment with Haftar is there, providing uh, military equipment, uh, training, and so on. Um, but unlike the UAE and Egypt, France, you know, engages with the GNA, uh, you know, with the, uh, you know, um, However, as I said, behind the scenes, it does some, something else, which has led to problems between, not only within NATO, but within the EU itself. 
uh, and that is the, 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 the problem that is happening currently uh, with France's position because you had the a conference to try to bring about peace and so on and so forth, but it, uh, you know, it, it created more problems because of this alignment with the rogue uh, marshal. Um, I'm going to skip, I'm sorry, um, uh, because I need to talk about other players, Russia. And Russia here is very interesting as well for students who are interested. You're going to see also a double game uh, that Russia plays. Uh, you know, it supports Haftar, uh, Tutankhamun, basically militarily and so on and so forth, but not for, for him to take over and that would be it. No, they want to give him enough power to have a big say at the negotiation table. Unlike other countries which recognize only the GNA, uh, Russia believes that uh, Haftar uh, should have uh, a place in, uh, in, in, uh, in the Libyan uh, landscape, the political uh, landscape. Uh, of course, things might, might, might change uh, because of the defeat uh, that uh, the, the, the recent defeat of Haftar uh, in, uh, in Tripoli. Um, so what is happening here in the last two years, um, you'll see Russia organize meetings, negotiations between Tripoli and, uh, and Haftar. Um, and, but of course, each time it's disappointed because Haftar has no interest in having, at least until recently, had no interest in uh, having, uh, he wanted the whole country rather than, uh, than you know, like a power sharing or what have you. He wanted to be the new CC uh, of, um, uh, of Libya. So Russia continues, like others, uh, to violate, uh, you know, to violate uh, the U United Nations Security Council resolution of 1970, uh, which banned uh, the uh, the arms sales uh, to Libya and and so on. So, uh, but Russia is not basically, I mean, implicated uh, with its own troops and so on and so forth. Uh, there are there is a group called the Wagner Group, which is a proxy of the state of the Russian state. And so, so Russia supplies it with, because when you say the Russians you are implicated, they say no. So these guys are recruited, uh, you know, to fight in, in Libya. But of course, uh, you and I uh, do not believe that. But for Moscow, Moscow has a, a very interesting strategy, uh, which I cannot go in depth, and, but it is multifaceted and it has uh, different um, aspects. And, but Russia's presence, let's put it this way, simply, uh, uh, you know, uh, worries uh, the United States and we come to the United States later. So, uh, but as long as the United States is absent, which it is currently, uh, it is, you know, Russia will continue, uh, you know, with this, uh, with this, uh, uh, with this uh, conflict and being, you know, active. The other actor is the UAE, very big actor. The UAE has intervened in Libya. It's a small state. Uh, it's anti-democratic, wants to undo, uh, wants to stop anything that um, could have succeeded through the Arab uprisings in terms of uh, democracy and so on and so forth, whatever, you know, whichever way you define it. But um, they are also worried that this kind of uh, uh, success with the Arab uprisings, uh, you know, uh, and establishing the rule of law, democratic rule, and so on, would have a spillover effect on the Gulf countries, and that's why they resist um, that. So, so basically, the UAE has been one of the biggest sponsors of the Haftar uh, military, uh, the, the Libyan National Army, uh, and so, and, and they espouse his rhetoric of being pro-stability, you know, and, and so that's how uh, it justifies its presence, although it, it, it talks about, you know, humanitarian presence, but it has bombed positions, uh, they have committed atrocities and so on uh, and so forth. So, so much for the UAE, I have much more, but since my time is um, limited, um, 
my prediction is that the UAE will, especially since it's supported by France as well, will continue supporting Haftar to prolong Libya's divisions uh, and shoring up, you know, the LNA, uh, you know, the LNA's control over Libya's east and its uh, oil fields. Um, so uh, let me go to the United States. The United States, uh, you have to look at it in terms of the United. If you are a student of U.S. Libyan relations, although Libya was a headache for the United States, but it was never important for the United States because, first of all, the United States did not import much oil uh, uh, from Libya, so it has never been at the top of its foreign policy agenda, uh, even in the Middle East. So Libya was something different. It's uh, annoying, but it was not really uh, important. It was always the, the, the in, in American foreign policy makers. Um, Libya was, was uh, the problem for the Europeans and others and the region, not, not, not of the United States, not very important. So it was always looked through the lens of other competing interests in the, in the region. But terrorism, military requirements for other conflicts, and so on and so forth. And you all know about the reluctance of Obama, President Obama, to intervene in Libya. It was pushed by Hillary Clinton, uh, Samantha Powell, uh, and Susan Rice. You know, the three ladies had pushed for intervention, but he was very reluctant to do so. And he even proclaimed later he regretted that. To make a story short, uh, the United States was involved. Uh, there are different stages. It was very much involved after, uh, you know, to go after the terrorists who had killed uh, Christopher Stevens, who was the U.S. Uh, ambassador to Libya in 2012, in September 2012. Um, and then when uh, when uh, the Islamic, so-called Islamic State, uh, settled in, in Libya, the United States uh, organized about 500 uh, airstrikes, uh, you know, to uh, diminish uh, the potency of, of, of ISIS. Um, so the U.S. has been uh, pushing for the U.N., the European allies, and some regional partners to uh, assume uh, to assume uh, leadership uh, in, in in this uh, uh, in the Libya's stabilization and reconstruction. So, so basically, uh, if you look at the recent statements coming from the United States, is basically to encourage uh, others uh, or to have a settlement, but expressing real concern about the presence of Russia, uh, the fear that Russia would establish a military bases and have a, uh, a continued presence uh, in, uh, in Libya. So that's, that's uh, for, for, for the United States. Now, I think that uh, I need to talk a little bit more before in the last few minutes that I have is to talk about the immediate neighborhood that is Algeria and Tunisia. Maybe I would maybe, submit to uh, you. Yeah, yeah, maybe we do that in the Q&A because we... Okay. Have, yeah. I'll, All right. If we okay, have so I have covered the... the, uh, the I have covered the uh, the foreign powers, and uh, of course, if you need more, I uh, will be happy to uh, to deal. Thank with you. Thank, Thank you very much, and I'm sorry. So there much. is a lot. It to was a real, real tour de force, as they say in French. So it's excellent, and a lot of food for thought. I have a um, few questions here. I'll start with um, the first one from John. Um, he says, "Can you please?" Um, talk a bit about why France aligned with Haftar. Uh, were the, was, the, was there a deterioration in relations between France and the GNA? Um, yeah, there is no deterioration of relations between the, the GNA, really. Uh, it, it is a way of, some people are even arguing um, that, that French policy is led by UAE policy. And, and France is very much, um, uh, how should I put it, impressed by the UAE, first for financial uh, uh, reasons, uh, but also because there is this sense of um, the UAE, just like France, uh, being uh, opposed 
uh, to Islamism, however defined it is, um, but also because uh, the UAE helps France in Sub-Saharan Africa in many countries uh, through funding. It did that with the G5 in the Sahel, uh, where the UAE uh, promised, I don't know how much of it they, 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 they gave, but they talked about uh, at, the time, at the time when France was uh, trying to get funding for the G5. If we're not familiar with the G5, this is uh, what France came up with, this sort of organization between uh, five um, uh, Sahelian states uh, under the leadership uh, of, of, of France, and France was looking for uh, financing from different sources. The European Union gave some, others didn't want to, the US uh, gave some money, but didn't want it to go uh, through the UN and so on and so forth. So uh, it, it's not a fallout. France is playing on two, uh, two sides. Uh, on the one hand, it proclaims that it deals with uh, you know, it recognizes uh, the legal government, uh, the legitimate one, uh, which is the GNA. Um, but on the other hand, uh, it has opposed any sanctions against Haftar, for instance. Mm -hmm. So, so it, it, it believes that Haftar would give uh, Total, the oil company, you know, access to, to the oil and, and so on and so forth, that if Haftar wins, uh, France will have a privileged position in Libya. And since when France supports democratic regimes in North Africa anyway, it's always dodgy <laughs> ground. In, if, uh, between us Maghribis, we know that very well. But I have another question from Dana. She's asking about uh, China's geopolitical interest in Libya. Um, can you shed more light on that? I mean, particularly in relation to the current conflict, we haven't heard about China's role or China's interference. Very good. I, 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 I was expecting uh, that question. China was very much involved in Libya economically, and it was very important. It had more than 38,000 workers in Libya until, uh, you know, uh, the overthrow of Gaddafi. Um, and of course, uh, it was one of the best examples, at least for China, uh, it, it repatriated, uh, exfiltrated, uh, it's 38,000 without any loss of life in 2011, with the help, of course, of Tunisia to put, you know, uh, some of them there. But it lost billions because it had invested billions of dollars. Um, it's estimated at 20 or 30 billion dollars uh, that it lost. And when there was a transition government in Libya, uh, you know, China has these principles of non-interference. So they did not recognize the uh, transitional, uh, uh, what was it called, uh, NTC, uh, transitional national transition uh, committee um, until late. And so there were these suspicions between China and uh, the transition uh, uh, committee. But eventually, uh, China is basically positioning itself for reconstruction. It can come up with you know, the money that is necessary to rebuild uh, Libya. It keeps its distance. Uh, I think it, it, it recognizes the GNA, has no involvement with the rogue marshal. So, so China is, in a sense, neutral. You know, China is not known, at least in the Middle East and North Africa, of having really played a mediation role. Uh, it, it, it will call on all the parties to find a political solution, but it has not been uh, an active uh, player uh, in, in Libya. So I have a, a question by Stephen and Mehmet, which are both similar, and they are both, both asking about whether you think there is a way forward in terms of finding peace for the Libyan people. Do you think that um, the different um, militias within Libya, as well as the foreign states that are interfering in the um, uh, conflict, can find a way forward, can sit down and negotiate and find a solution? Uh, <laughs> this is the one billion dollar question. It's a great question, uh, but as I have been hinting at, you know, um, the foreign powers don't want to. The U.S. has not gone to the UAE and said, stop supplying weapons. Uh, the EU has not been able to tell France, 
stop. In fact, there was a problem between Italy and France. So they are not interested. And I think uh, there will be, and, and, and there was, you know, there was a, uh, the region, like uh, there was an Algerian, uh, Tunisian sort of a proposal uh, to, you know, to speak to all the parties, to bring them together. But everyone, every outsider and every insider, that is the ones who are inside, as long as they, they get this foreign support, they feel that they can continue having the upper hand. Right now it's the GNA. When the GNA was able to defeat the LNA, you know, in Tripoli and push it back, mm -hmm. you know, and Turkey uh, uh, advancing, you know, the, the, the LNA said, or in Egypt, oh, negotiation. But of course, the GNA was not going to accept because figured the moment you start negotiating, the other side would be bombing anyway. Uh, or will continue or would be pushed by Egypt to do something different. So, so to me, uh, uh, as long as the United Nations Security Council uh, does not put enough pressure, but then again, you have Russia, which is both involved uh, in the field and is, uh, has a veto power at the United Nations Security Council. I think that only the Libyan people if they're, you know, and but the pol the political elites in Libya, I think, are are also, you know, um, corrupt. Um, you know, uh, they are in the pockets of uh, outside powers, uh, and they have not shown any interest in moving forward to national rec reconciliation and uh, national reconstruction. It has been on the table. Um, you know, the uh, the elites have come to Algiers, for instance. And they had met, you know, separately. Algeria has proposed to them to sit around the uh, same table and find a, a way out to to stop this bloodshed and so on. But they haven't done it. And I, this has been my argument since uh, uh, the overthrow of Gaddafi uh, is, is to say, hey, now you have to rebuild, reconstruction, reconciliation. You know, don't keep you know hold grudges against the ones who served in the old. Uh, regime and so on, but you have to to have this kind of reconstruction, but it has not happened. And now you have uh, uh, this, uh, the militias, how do you disarm uh, the militias? And sometimes the militias are playing a, a positive role because they guarantee the security of neighborhoods and so on and so forth, but they are also manipulated uh, from uh, the outside serving some interests that are not those of the Libyan people. So Yahya, would would you think in the? I, I've got for my, uh, many more questions, but um, on that, the recent um, U.S. approach um, to the conflict with the meeting that um, a high official in the American government had with uh, Saraj on the possibility of um, building a military base. Uh, in Libya, do you think, because that's, that's kind of, uh, again, another strategic game because they need to control the Sahel, going back to the Sahel. And of course, none of the Maghribi states wanted to have the base. Uh, so it's only, I mean, now Libya seems like a good place. Uh, and, and if that happens, would that allow a kind of um, the American coming behind the Saraj um, UN backed government and will kind of tip the powers or you know, get the, get the um, uh, as you said, with the um, Khalifa Haftar is not really in good terms now with the Egyptian, the UAE, the Russians and the others because he lost. So he may be changed. Another figure may come up who could be more conciliatory. Do you see any glimpses of hope that just very briefly, like uh, the recent... Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, the Russians toyed with the idea of bringing in uh, Saif al-Islam, you know, Gaddafi's yeah. son. Mm. So, uh, right now, to be quite honest with you, the U.S., if you take into account the context of U.S. policy right now, no interest in getting involved in Libya. Mm. The only uh, consensus in the administration, in the Trump administration, is that uh, we should watch out about uh, uh, Russia's involvement. But they're too busy with COVID, with the election. So... I, I don't know of a, a, a base being built. In fact, you have one in Niger, very close, you know, drones base, 
uh, there was talk about a base in Tunisia. Uh, you know, uh, the Tunisians swear that it doesn't exist, but some people think it, it does. I don't think a base is going to add anything. Um, the U.S. is just watching. Um, but the game is now, and that's, the, the, I think, what is happening. The two big players remain Russia and Turkey. Mm -hmm. And Russia and Turkey, it's not so, solely about Libya. It's also about Syria. Yeah. You know, uh, each one watches the move of the other and how it will affect mm. their policy in it. Absolutely. The Although European they Union, had a pact in, in Syria, in Idlib province, which is very ironical. They seem to have pact somewhere and then... The engaging yeah. act of war somewhere else. I have another important question because we have a lot here. Yeah, yeah, excuse me. So this one is from Leo. He's asking about, um, you mentioned something about the division of Libya along west, west east lines, you know, the western Libya uh, with the capital as Tripoli, the eastern one with Benghazi. Um, and he is wondering that kind of bring colonial memories of European. Uh, drawn national borders in Africa and how that had serious repercussions. And um, do you think if that happened, the Libyans will think about unification? Ah, oh, that sounds a bit uh, horrific as well. But he also wants to ask um, uh, an excellent question about the civil society and uh, whether there is any Libyan civil society that could uh, bring a resolution to the conflict um, and wow. force the other different militias to sit down and negotiate. Tough question, <laughs> but you know, Libya um, until 51 was three provinces and they brought them together to constitute a state. Um, what is happening today is, again, the talk, uh, if we continue like this, then there might be a division, one being under the influence of Turkey, Qatar, Italy in the West, and then the rest, which is the East, you know, with, with Russia, uh, the UAE, uh, Egypt, you know. Uh, I don't know whether it will happen. Um, again, I, I hope for the Libyan people that this would not happen. The other good question is about civil society. What happened uh, on the ground is how the there was a, a burgeoning uh, civil society on the morrow of the overthrow of Gaddafi. And then for some weird reason, uh, dozens and dozens of civil society activists were assassinated, mm -hmm. including the woman, you know, Bourassis, who was uh, a leading force in mm -hmm. human rights and so on and so forth. So right now, it's uh, even the diaspora, is, is divided. Uh, nobody really know. I mean, there's this sort of um, stubbornness on the part of the elites. No one seems to want to give an inch to allow the reconstruction of this beautiful country. It, it has the potential of becoming a Japan in the Mediterranean. 6.2 million people, extremely rich. Uh, we talked about oil, we didn't talk about the, the water. You know that under uh, um, Gaddafi, they, they built the Great Grand Dam, I forgot the name of, of it. You know, with a lot of water that is uh, underneath, Libya could become uh, a real major power. Now for the Europeans, the interest is, you know, the fear of, refugees and migration. That, that's really what it is. And, and Turkey now, if it's too provoked by France, can unleash, you know, refugees from somewhere else, either from Syria or... So it, it's, again, I have said it all along, it's not a Libyan-Libyan war. Absolutely. I guess, Yahya, would you say, because um, this fragmentation, which was inherited from the Qaddafi regime, who um, in a way, he did not left a state, a structure of a state, but a fragmented state. Um, and that has, and the way, for example, he, um, um, uh, in a sense, um, pushed the eastern province into marginality in terms of power sharing and, and how that 
came out immediately after 2011. Um, in terms of seeking revenge of the way they've been marginalized, despite the fact that they have all the oil reserves in the eastern province. But I was also thinking in terms of the absence of a nationalist discourse that you usually associate with states, which could be part of the fact that there is no unitary aspect on, 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 on the conflict itself. But I have another very good question as well about the, from, um, I, I don't see the name, but um, they want to ask you about the Syrian mercenaries that Turkey sent to fight um, with the Western Bloc, with the Tripoli Bloc, with the UN-backed national government. Uh, how do you see their role? I mean... I skipped it. <laughs> it was in my slides. Uh, but see, uh, uh, Turkey brought in... Uh, it didn't... You know, uh, Erdogan got the okay from the Turkish parliament to send troops, but he did not send troops. He sent um, uh, advisors, military advisors, uh, trainers, and so on, but brought some Turkmen, ethnic Turks, from uh, the, the, the Syria zone, brought about 1,000 or 400 or so. Um, but by the way, it's not just Turkey, huh? once again. Uh, the, the UAE recruited Sudanese. Yeah. You know, they yeah. told them you're coming to, uh, to the UAE, to Abu Dhabi or Dubai, to work in security uh, sectors and so on, and then they send them to die in Libya. Mm. So, so uh, that's what, by the way, I forgot to say one thing that is extremely important. You talked about civil society, but there is an issue that if, pray that it does not happen. There has been talk about arming the tribes, and that would be disastrous for, Li for Libya. And again, I will, Karima, if you allow me, uh, and I know I, I, the risk of sounding even pro Gaddafi, which I have never been, everybody can read my writings on Gaddafi, but at least there was, it was not totally favoring one region against another. The Gaddafi, the Kadafa tribe, was a sort of pendulum. Uh, uh, created a sort of balance between all the tribes. That was, if there was one success that Gaddafi had, it, it was how it, he was able to balance out the various tribes. One time it's this, bringing, you know, someone from this tribe, from another from that tribe, to be in the government and so on and so forth. What he did not do was to create institutions. There were no institutions. He did not create institutes. His uh, revolutionary committees and all that, that stuff that he created, you know, probably he read, uh, somebody suggested he, he reads uh, uh, Rousseau's, uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau's, uh, you know, the social okay. contract and, <laughs> and, and, and just him imagined his, his uh, green book, you know, to create uh, this semblance of uh, democracy, you know, popular democracy and so on and so on. He had no, uh, this is why the, the state collapsed so easily uh, without uh, much uh, resistance. It, it was a very weak uh, state and, and, and no institutions. Absolutely, absolutely right. I have another question from Heba, who is asking about um, the role of Algeria and Tunisia. I know that Morocco held a meeting in 2015 in Sherat, which was quite crucial in um, forming of the national government. But going back to Heba's questions about Algeria and Tunisia, do you see any active role of these uh, two countries, despite their internal uh, tribulation, as Heba put it, um, in terms of the economic and um, protest movements? Look, uh, by the way, what you said about Morocco was that was not Morocco as such. It was the UN. It was the Sherat was the agreement. The meeting in Sherat. Right. It's mm -hmm. the Sherat agreement, which came from the Libyan uh, political uh, what was it called? Yeah. accord. Mm -hmm. And then it gave the, the GNA uh, that led to the GNA and to the recognition of that uh, party. There were many uh, attempts like that. Um, the role of Algeria, Algeria shares 1,000 kilometers with Libya. Mm. One advantage that Algeria has, well, because Algeria right now is spending so much money to protect its border and that of Tunisia, because Tunisia and Algeria, in a sense, are allied on this question 
very much so. They see eye to eye what's going on. Now, what no one understands up to today, the UN Secretary General appointed an Algerian, a former foreign minister, to be the special envoy, the mediator, you know, to replace Hassan Salami. For some weird reason, even the US ambassador could not say why. It was vetoed by the United States. And now there's no one. Now, Algeria has offered, uh, and in fact, even uh, Aguila was, was, was in Algeria not long ago. Uh, Sarraj went to Algeria. Uh, Hafta. Algeria is probably the best potential broker because it knows all the sides. It knows the Kadatva, the, the tribes, it has even some of the militias. And it has that experience of brokering reconciliation uh, approaches like it did in its own domestic when it had its own civil war. Mm -hmm. So it learned from that experience and tried to uh, you know, share it with the Libyans. And it doesn't have a preference for either, you know, whether it's Saraj or uh, what have you. It, it, and it has a history of mediation. It has mediate, mediated several conflicts, including Eritrea, uh, Ethiopia, um, uh, US, uh, Iran, and so on and so forth. So it, and, and, and Qais in Tunis now is also in agreement with that. And they are against the presence of foreign forces and all. France says, oh, I share your position. It tells Algeria, I share your position. But then it goes, it goes and sides with Haftar. Mm -hmm. So uh, again, the entrenched interests of each of the foreign parties that I talked about is preventing a resolution of the conflict in Libya. And Algeria, I'm, I'm afraid, uh, does not have the necessary weight in this big game to be allowed. It's not being allowed in. In other words, even if it comes up with the best possible solution, it contradicts the interests mm -hmm. you know, uh, 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 of the other players. So as long, Egypt is in competition with Algeria. It wants to have its own influence over Libya and so on and so forth. Algeria doesn't really like Turkish presence. Uh, I had interviewed officials. I am the one who tried to convince them that if it hadn't been for Turkey, you wouldn't have had a balance of power. Then, you know, Saraj would have been defeated. And so later it seemed that that's what, what happened. You know, some parts of the government agreed, uh, but they were not too happy with Turkish presence. If it were up to the Algerians, it should be left to the Libyan, uh, to the Libyans you, themselves. You made an important point there about a glimpse of hope that uh, the resolution could come from neighbors who knows the, um, you know, the geopolitics of tribes and affiliations and the east and the east and the west division and all that. So possibly the Algerians will take an interest because so far they were quite not interested, but mainly because their house was also, or has always uh, also been in a bit of a mess. Going back to another question um, about Turkey. Um, so Chiaoli is saying that uh, Turkey has established two military bases in Libya. Um, and of course they may be kind of geopolitical outcomes would the region face. I mean, you touched on that a bit. So a brief, answer please yeah 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 uh, two bases uh, there um, again turkey has made no secret uh, of its of, of its presence and support uh, for uh, the saraj uh, government uh, and there's almost a modus vivendi between uh, uh, turkey and russia that you know, what, what happens in the West is yours, what even happens in the East uh, is mine and so on. Uh, but I, I am not sure whether a reconciled Libya 
and reconciled with its neighbors as well, would allow the existence of permanent bases in Libya. Uh, at least this is my, um, my understanding. Uh, right now, yes, uh, Saraj needs Turkey. Without Turkey, he would not be able to. And Turkey needs to also have a government uh, that mirrors its own, uh, a conservative uh, government based on Muslim Brotherhood principles and so on and so forth. So um, I don't think even Russia would, uh, would build a permanent base because it already has um, base in bases in Syria. Uh, I am not so sure that it would, uh, but it, it would to basically um, provoke or force the Europeans uh, to uh, recon with, uh, with 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 Russia uh, in terms of migration, refugees, and so on and so forth. So um, I, I, I think that Russia has, for now, you know, to supply, because the U.S. has uncovered with the imaging and all that, there are Suhoi's, MiGs that are present in Libya uh, that, you know, that were used by the Wagner Group and so on and so forth. So it's there. Whether... I think that a, a resolution uh, among the reconciliation between the Libyans uh, would end that, uh, that presence uh, eventually. Okay, great, thank you. I'm thinking there of, as well, talking about the European Union, about the role of um, Italy, because Italy, of course, is the one that is very much worried about the influx of uh, the migrants from the Sahel and from Africa, because Libya always had that border thing. And of course, it has sided largely with Haftar, because they think that he is going to keep those... Um, well, he's been persecuting these uh, immigrants. I mean, there are a few atrocities committed um, against them. So it makes you think, I think there was an early question about France loses its reputation. I think John had a follow-up about um, siding with um, um, clearly um, a dictator who, was, who could be as worse as, as, as Qaddafi and putting, you know, that supporting or backing from some countries in the European Union, which is extremely problematic. I have another question about, from uh, Abdul Salam about um, the division between, you know, the um, Krinaika Burqa and the Trabzon, you know, the, that traditional division that existed um, in, in Libyan history uh, throughout the Ottoman Empire and when the Senussi uh, dynasties brought the two regions together. But it seems to come back and haunt Libya, that Eastern and Western divide along tribal lines. Um, he's asking, do you see this as a colonial legacy or do you see it as something that is part of the making of um, Libya itself? That, which I guess is, is part of the making of most nations. I mean, going back to that idea of a nationalist um, unifying discourse that Qaddafi failed to come up with in a way. I, I think it's both. There is the colonial legacy and there's, I, I think that was my argument from the beginning today, to say there's one part which is the, their own doing, the Libyans own doing, and one part is you know, the, uh, the outsiders exploiting uh, those divisions. By the way, I need to correct something. You said that somebody said that uh, Italy supported Haftar. Uh, Italy is nominally on the side of the GNA, of Saraj. But it did once receive Haftar as if he was a head of state. Mm -hmm. But in reality, Italy is more, has more interest with the GNA, uh, especially for its oil company, ENI, uh, and so on and so on. And it feels, it mm -hmm. feels, this is what neocolonialism is. It feels that because it was the former colonial powers, mm -hmm. uh, power, it should have more of a say in Libyan affairs. But That's again, the, its attitude is ambiguous as France. I mean, it's not very clear who, who, who they play that double game, which is 
not helping um, with the resolution of the conflict. Thanks, Yahya. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm going to ask regarding, regarding France, um, and that's something I did not finish. Uh, Turkey has basically destroyed uh, France's plans in Libya completely. And France had not played its card uh, more honestly, uh, either supporting the GNA correctly and seeking a, a, a resolution. When it alienated its uh, fellows at the European Union and in NATO, and Turkey now, you know, bomb le torse, comme on dit, you know, uh, it has nothing. What is the card that France has right now in, in Libya? I, I mean, that goes back to what you said about the emergence of the new Ottoman um, Khalifat with Erdogan and the idea of controlling parts of the Arab world, because Turkey now is really a major player in the new Arab Cold War, you know, in the way it sided with Qatar against the UAE and the Saudis. And so it's quite um, another dimension that is um, uh, that's going to have a big role in the coming months and, and, and years. I'm going to ask the audience, does anybody want to raise their hand and ask a question um, directly to Yahya? Yeah, is there anybody who wants to be to unmute themselves and ask a question? Um, hi, Karima. Hello, Mahjoub. It's so nice to see you here. Hi. Uh, thank you, Yahya, for your uh, great uh, presentation. I'm uh, sorry, I, I was in a meeting, so I, I joined a little bit late. Um, um, I, those who don't know me, my name is Mahjoub Zwayri. I am the director of Gulf Study Center at Qatar University. Um, I just want to add, um, I think you correctly defined the crisis. It's, it's about the role of players from outside and, you know, insiders seem to be basically following rather than initiating and this applies in Syria, applies in other cases. Um, and I just, I want to elaborate on, on, on the, the role of, of the Gulf in the whole thing. Um, it's obvious that the division uh, in the Gulf, uh, the echo, the reflection of that, we saw it in Libyan crisis because um, the Gulf was divided between uh, um, a pro-Arab spring and, uh, you know, counter-revolutionary. So, that division reflected there. And the, the example we saw in, in, in Libya, it's obvious that um, Saudis and Emiratis, uh, with the support of Egypt, they invested a lot because they wanted to maintain the status quo um, and you know, make sure that the whole concept of, and the outcome of Arab Spring failed. Um, and that, that's the way they can basically survive. Um, and it's obvious that um, uh, with, the inter with, the, with, with the role of Turkey, um, the whole thing upside down now. I think um, it's obvious that um, Saudi and Emiratis now, they are struggling to maintain the status quo they have and mm -hmm. obvious that Haftar is not actually doing them a favor. Mm -hmm. And the problem they are facing, they don't have other option. They don't have plan B. They don't have, even Saif al al Qadhafi is not the right person according to them, according to their own calculation. So even if he suggested, I think, from what I see and following up, is not the right person. And I think the main dilemma they are facing now is actually who is the person, if they said, if they shown the red card to Haftar, who will be the person replacing him? And I think that is the main dilemma. And that is the, that is the momentum was given indirectly to Turkey and the Wafaq uh, government to survive and 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 to you know, main, you know um, able to gain this kind of international uh, support, and it's obvious that you know um, as long as you know the Gulf will have its impact. I think with the uncertainty now with international politics, American uh, elections, um, you know the crisis, the, the epidemic, and even the crisis in yeah, in, in in Lebanon, mm -hmm. um, it's obvious that we will have this uncertainty until the start of 2021. And I think we is expected to see this um, uh, very clear on Libyan front um, uh, um, because of this, uh, all of these uh, uh, elements. Again, thank you, Yahya, and thank you, Karima, for inviting me. Thanks. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Mahjoub. Thank you, Mahjoub. I want to add a little line. Um, you know, 
all of a sudden, everybody is talking about uh, trying to prop up some Arab nationalism coming even from the Gulf against the Turks. They did it against Iran, for Shia, you know, the, you know the, that's the main enemy, which, uh, you know, suggests that we should align with Israel and so on and so forth against, you know, Iran. And now it's uh, uh, Ottomans. Of course, uh, uh, Erdogan is playing on that too for, for the domestic, you know, uh, by the way, I was going to cite to you, I have the, the latest uh, survey in Turkey. He got a lot of support on what he's doing in Libya. He got more than 60% mm. because he's playing, you know, and we are back. Uh, he had given some signs, you know, he was rebuilding the Kechawa Mosque in Algeria, you know, a vestige of, of Turkey and so on and so on. But I, you know, I am not naive. I, I, I know neorealism. What is happening is Turkey's national interest, oh. that simple. Ottomanism, you can use it as a symbolic, but the reality is Turkey is playing game, a solid game, and has the wherewithal to do what it needs to do. It did it when Sarraj said, I need you. Okay, I come. They didn't go by themselves. And by the way, among all those who have intervened in Libya, and I'm going to be hated by the Arabs here, you know, the only country that has a legitimate right to be in, in Libya is Turkey. Why? Because Turkey was called in by the recognized government. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it says, I need help. Just like France went to Mali, it went legally because, you know, the, oh, yeah, uh, yeah. the government of Mali uh, asked the, the, the French to come to the rescue. And that's recognized in international law. Yeah, so. I, I mean, it's fascinating also that Erdogan is very popular in the Arab world. He is extremely popular. So he has got the back. He speaks to the Arab publics. Not, I mean, he's hated by some government, but he does speak to the Arab publics. And what he's doing is highly approved among the people. Anybody yes. else? Thanks. Thanks very much. Anybody wants to raise their hands and um, ask a question? Otherwise, I think we've exhausted uh, Yahya. Um, so I think Yahya. It's been fun. It's, it's been a huge pleasure to have you. Thank you so much for waking up so early um, to talk to us from Marseille. And uh, thanks everybody for coming. And um, we have another public lecture coming up soon. So we'll send you the details about that. Thanks very much, Yahya. Thanks everyone. Thank you very much for having me. Good evening. Bye-bye everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.